I suppose it's fair to say, in my sister's account, I have no career risk. She isn't going to fire me. Ever since legendary investor Jeremy Grantham told WealthTrack how he kept his sister's money safe during the financial crisis, I have wondered, what about all the other women, many of them divorced, widowed, or lifelong singles, who don't have Jeremy Grantham to call upon? Well, we've started a new feature on WealthTrack's website called WealthTrack Women. On a regular basis, investment pros who specialize in advising female clients will answer questions vital to the financial health of women. Look for it on WealthTrack.com. This week on WealthTrack, the energy revolution. With oil and gas production increasing rapidly in various parts of the country, financial thought leader and energy guru Tom Petrie tells us what it means for energy independence, the economy, and national security. Next on Consuelo Mac WealthTrack. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. Rosalind P. Walter and the Fairhome Foundation. Hello and welcome to this special energy edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Are we in the midst of an energy revolution? Is it possible that the U.S. could become energy independent with all of the enormous economic and national security implications that would entail? Before I discuss those questions with this week's guest, some perspective might be helpful. Until the recent shale oil technology revolution, the common wisdom was that U.S. oil production had peaked in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Called Hubbard's Peak after M. King Hubbard, the oil geologist who predicted it in 1956, oil production, which had been increasing since the 1900s, was expected to peak as known oil reserves were depleted. Until recent years, Hubbard's Peak was believed to be a fact of life. Then came game-changing technology called hydraulic fracturing or fracking, a process that injects fluids, mostly water, under high pressure into horizontally drilled oil or gas wells. That fracking process forces apart or fractures tight rock formations, releasing previously inaccessible oil and gas reserves. The difference in U.S. oil and gas production from fracking is huge. In oil alone, the International Energy Agency predicts production, which had been declining for decades, will soar, especially in desirable light crude from those tight rock formations. The impact on natural gas production is also enormous. By some estimates, it is expected to increase 30 to 40 percent from current levels. According to independent research firm Cornerstone Macro, increased domestic oil and gas production has already had a dramatic impact on energy imports. Imports have fallen by almost half to the lowest level in more than two decades. This week's financial thought leader guest has spent over four decades in the oil and gas industry as an analyst, investment banker, and advisor to energy companies, investors, and governments, and he has just written a book about it. He is Tom Petrie, chairman of Petrie Partners, a boutique energy-focused investment banking firm, and his book is Following Oil, Four Decades of Cycle Testing Experiences and What They Foretell About U.S. Energy Independence. During those 40 years, Tom has been vice chairman of Bank of America Merrill Lynch, co-founder and partner of his previous energy investment banking firm, Petrie Parkman, and in his analyst days was voted number one oil analyst for eight years running in the exploration independent oil sector by Institutional Investor Magazine. I began the interview by asking Petrie why he believes we are indeed experiencing an energy revolution. This is a period where there's some major game changers going on in the energy supply. Uh, it's a, it, what we now have is a situation where the outlook for the next one, two, possibly three decades is much brighter than we thought it was 10 years ago. That's revolutionary. That's a, it's, a, it's a game changer because the model for finding and developing 
uh, new supplies of oil and gas in North America has totally shifted. And uh, From what to what? From a situation where we thought we were in irreversible decline, that was the mode we've been in actually for the last right. three the decades. The Hubbard's Peak. Mm -hmm. The Hubbard's Peak, to a mode where we've indefinitely postponed uh, that. In fact, we're going back to, we're on the way to getting back to the old peak achieved in 1970 for U.S. production of oil uh, and other liquids. And uh, in all likelihood, we're going to have uh, a period of plateau at those high levels for quite a period to come, certainly into the next decade, possibly into the next two decades. What about gas? You mentioned oil. What about our gas output? That's even more important. That's a, that's a big part of this revolution as well, because gas is actually more environmentally friendly, right. less carbon, uh, and the supply elasticity uh, is such that the resource potential is tenfold greater than we thought it was 10 years ago. Tenfold greater. Uh, that's unimaginable uh, prior to some of these new developments. So, so that means that we have 10 times more gas put to, All, that we can produce potential. ultimately than we thought we had 10 years ago. That's right. You have been following oil and you write about it in your book, Following Oil, for four decades. Right. And you have written about the fact that we've had other big changes occur on the energy scene before that didn't pan out. So why are you confident that this change, in fact, this shale oil will pan out? The, the technology that's come along uh, is very impressive, number one. But most importantly, the basic models change. The old model spoke to, the technical model spoke to the idea that oil or gas is generated in one part of the Earth's subsurface, mm -hmm. migrates out of that area into much higher quality rock, the high porosity, high permeability, so it could flow to the surface rapidly. The problem is you had to get the timing right, you had to actually generate it, hit the timing right, and trap it somewhere else. That's the product of three probabilities. That's a one in six chance that you're gonna get what you want. In this case, we're going back to where it was generated in the first place. And all, and so, all so original fields or, 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 or original? It's called source rock. Okay. It's where it was generated or exactly right next door. We're not taking this long, long range migration notion. And basically for the first 140 years of the oil business and the last 100 years of the gas business, we were, we were working with that old model. But now we've drilled most of those cases where it did migrate and was trapped. But now we've said, let's go find where the source rock is ubiquitous in a basin, very present over a wide area. Let's go in and with the new technology, let's figure out how to break apart that rock where it's generated. And as long as the breaking apart takes less energy going in, then comes out by a multiple, two, three, four, five, six times, then we've got a new model. So it's economically feasible now with this new technology. Exactly, uh, and this, this is a revolutionary thing. It took, it took years of innovation by a number of different people. George Mitchell of Mitchell Energy gets a lot of credit for it and deserves it because he was persistent in the face of adversity in, in pursuing it down in Texas near Fort Worth in what's called the Barnett Shale. Suddenly there was an awareness, if it works in this shale called the Barnett Shale near Fort Worth, maybe it'll work in the Fayetteville Shale in Arkansas. Maybe it'll work in the Haynesville Shale in North Louisiana. What about the Marcellus all through Appalachia? And then within a year, less than a year, 12 other shales were being pursued by the industry, each looking to see whether it would work there. Two thirds of those shales proved to be successful and today they're being developed. Let's talk about kind of the mother load of all shale oil development, right? Is, is it the Bakken field, is that what it's called, in North Dakota? Arguably it is, because uh, it's oil up there, not gas, right. and oil is, has greater utility right now. But it's also the Marcellus in Appalachia. The Marcellus in Appalachia has the potential before the end of this decade, probably well before, two or three years before the end of this decade, could rival the output of, of the uh, Amir of, of gutters uh, gas, which is the third largest source of gas in the world. Now it's not as large a resource, 
but its productivity is so high that the Marcellus could rival that of Gutter, one of the major gas exporters in the world. In the, to go back to your point, right. uh, the Bakken. In North Dakota. In North Dakota. Right. Uh, could be somewhere between two and four times as big as Prudhoe Bay in Alaska. Unimaginable 10 years ago. Um, the Eagleford in Texas will not be as big as the Bakken, but the productivity of the wells and the proximity to market economically, it's almost as significant. And then in Colorado, we have the Niobrara. Uh, regionally, it's very important for the economy of the Rocky Mountains. So there's a series of these opportunities now to be pursued. And they've now moved from the evaluation stage to the economic development stage. And that's why I have some confidence. So the headlines, of course, that we read about frequently are the environmental concerns of fracking. So address that. There are real environmental impacts. Anybody who would argue otherwise, uh, you have to wonder where they're coming from. Uh, when I said we want to break the rock apart, right. that takes energy in. It is a, uh, a process of breaking the rock apart. And uh, so you hear about concern about earthquakes. You hear concern about the water that's being used. You hear about methane leaks. These are all issues that the industry knows about and is looking to address. And, and they're real concerns. They are, and they're valid concerns. Yes. Uh, so it does, uh, in cases where this development's occurring near housing developments and so on, uh, they will be disturbing um, to a degree. Now, the importance of this is that it's a relatively short period to actually do it. It's typically less than 90 days to drill a well. Uh, it's a fairly short period of a week or so, uh, in most cases, sometimes maybe two weeks, to actually do the fracking, and then they move out and it's, it's relatively undisturbed thereafter. But, uh, but they are concerns. The environmental issues are less some of the asserted ones. For example, the concern about drinking water from an aquifer, which is typically less than 1,000 feet into the Earth's surface, and uh, the, where this is occurring, typically a mile to two miles in the Earth's surface. Usually, there's quite a layer of impermeable rock where the actual uh, risk of one interfering with the other, the, the, the hydrocarbons interfering with the water, is uh, very, very low and very manageable. What are the trade-offs? In, in terms of en environmental issues, uh, the trade-offs are that we have to deal with uh, how the water that's involved in the process is treated. We have to deal with uh, methane leaks. We have to deal with uh, any other environmental impacts that are, that are talked about, but those are the big ones. Uh, return water from fracking can be treated in a way where it's bioremediated. That means we eliminate the presence of the fossil uh, remnants that are in that, in that material. There are oil and gas eating uh, enzymes that can be applied and you can end up with water that's cleaner than drinking water from a bottle of drinking water. What is your view of the U.S. energy policy, if there is one now? And this has been a frustration of yours um, over the years as well, that we don't seem to have an energy policy. Do well, we need one and what's the state of it now? Well, all policy, economic policy making in this country is a subject of what can be sold to Congress and then sold to the president who's going to sign what Congress creates. And as we've seen in recent times with a lot of legislation, what Congress creates is, uh, as somebody said, the definition of a camel is a horse designed by a committee. And, uh, and some of our legislation meets that definition. So the, ideally, we want a policy that recognizes the economic and technical realities of the situation. Um, what's interesting about the transformation that we started this discussion with is it didn't come because of an ideal policy. We, it came because policy had relaxed to a degree in terms of regulatory constraint, and there was a bubble up innovation on the technical side that brought forth this new supply elasticity. We're just coming to grips with that. Uh, so hopefully you start with something that's the equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath. Do no harm. Mm -hmm. And now, when you say do no harm environmentally, uh, it's one thing. When you say do no harm in terms of supply availability, there's a dynamic tension there. But the ideal is a policy that recognizes let's not create artificial constraints on the availability of supply. 
What could derail the energy revolution? Uh, well, there's a couple of things. Um, there, there's some big decisions to be made this coming election uh, in my state. In the state of Colorado, there, there are a lot of initiatives by those who would like to derail the use of fossil fuels uh, much more radically than is probably going to occur naturally over the balance of the, this century. And so uh, local, there, there's initiatives that would say, let's have local decisions on whether you can frack or not. It turns out the local decisions at the town level, at the municipal level, certainly appeal to those who, who like NIMBY, not in my backyard. Right. But the nature of the resource is a very valuable resource for all the citizens of a state. Uh, so when you, Colorado is a good test case of this. Basically, uh, the potential is probably three to five billion barrels of oil that could be developed over the next one to three decades. Uh, the, the, the economic benefit of that would be probably a half a trillion dollars. That's a large number. You know, we've learned to talk in trillions mm -hmm. post the financial meltdown, but a half a trillion in the state of Colorado, there's no Alone. close second. There's no close second. Right. This is not a, a, a Hertz and Avis. It's, it's Hertz and the next one is, you know, mom and pop rental car. Right. And, and so that amount of economic benefit to be uh, constrained because each and every uh, community chooses to say, we don't want it in our backyard, uh, is, is, is a big, big decision. Um, and, they, and so there are a lot of things that come from that. People are talking about the U.S. could be energy independent in the foreseeable future. Is that a likelihood? I'd say it's, it's a worthy goal. Um, barrel for barrel independence is not critical. Um, it's more important that we, that we actually uh, achieve a workable connection in the global markets. Uh, and and what I, the term I would rather use is energy secure. And you get to energy security well short of being barrel for barrel independent. We're still consuming 17, 18 million barrels a day, uh, even today, with conservation down from a high of 21 million barrels a day, and maybe on its way to 15. We're, we're at 8 million barrels a day of production on its way to 10, 11, maybe 12. At, at, at 11 or 12 million barrels a day, uh, with growing gas production and exports, and with this improvement in the balance between what we could export in the way of high value oil and import lower, we would be highly energy secure, in my view, at something like 11, possibly 12 million barrels a day. Um, and I think that's a much better goal than the idea of saying, well, if we're consuming 15, we've got to produce 15. Um, the investment implications for this energy revolution, how do we make money from this? Well, it, number one, it's, uh, it's happening as we speak. Uh, in our markets, we, you, you hear things about an improved manufacturing capability in the United States. One of the biggest areas where we still have a competitive edge, bar none, over, over the rest of the world, is our, in our development of technologies to exploit oil. And it's been a competitive edge for, for years, but the new innovations are largely occurring here and the manufacturing of equipment to do it are largely occurring here. Uh, some of the, 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 the very best drilling technology exists um, uh, in the United States. Some of the innovations that you see, I'm, I'm on the board, full disclosure, I've been on the board of Helmer & Payne. Helmer & Payne has come up with innovative drilling technology that has cut drilling time and improved penetration rates and reduced drilling costs dramatically. And they, their capabilities then have knock-on benefits to the likes of Caterpillar and, and a whole lot of other manufacturers of the equipment. Um, so we're seeing, we're seeing a broad capability in the oil service arena with, uh, with job creation that goes way beyond the people who are on the site drilling the well. And um, that's going to continue. Um, most of these innovations are causing uh, foreign companies to come here to learn about this. So 
you are no longer an oil analyst. You have been an investment banker for a long time, so you cannot recommend individual companies. That's right. But who are the major players, Tom? In categories. Yes. Number one, uh, the upstream sector still matters, and it's the most important. So the the, the better positioned companies in the upstream sector. Upstream meaning? Uh, meaning the, the companies that are involved with, with raising the capital and putting it to work to develop new sources of production in the major plays, in the, in the Bakken formation of North Dakota, in the Eagleford formation of Texas, in the Permian Basin of Texas. Those three big areas are the ones that are gonna develop three to four million barrels a day in the U.S. Uh, secondly, there's the service sector mm -hmm. and all the big names. Oil in, service, in right. The oil service right. sector. All the big names in the oil service sector are very focused on what they're doing to develop that. Right. You know, and I, the give drillers, you, the uh, these these are uh, partly drillers, partly uh, fracking companies. Mm -hmm. uh, they're that specialize in in analyzing and developing techniques to frack and develop those resources. And the, you know, those names are well known. So I'm, these right. are not recommendations, but you know, they're they're the you know, the large capitalizations, the Schlumberger, Halliburton, um, and Baker Hughes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are the companies that specialize in figuring out how to go down there, break the rock apart, do it economically, and turn it over to the upstream companies. Now, there, there's another great set of opportunities, uh, and that's in the midstream. Most of the midstream sector uh, lends itself to companies that, that are uh, involved with pipelines and involved with gathering systems, um, and much of that Get, fits into the MLP category, and there's a whole class Master of- Master Limited Partnership. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's right, Master Limited Partnership mm -hmm. yield companies. And those are, those are situations where that's another category worth looking at if you're an, an investor is looking for yield mm -hmm. with some growth. Mm -hmm. and, right. um, and each of those have, have a lot of merit. You have investment rules that you have developed over the last 40 years for investors who want to invest in energy. Number one, why should we invest in energy as investors in energy companies? Uh, we should invest because energy is, is one of the main drivers of economic growth throughout our economy, throughout the global economy. And uh, it's, it's demographically driven. We're in a world today of seven billion people. When I was born, the planet had two and a half billion people. So we've almost tripled. We're, we're, between now and 2030, we're gonna add almost another billion people. Between now and 2050, we'll probably add two and a half billion people. Uh, so the demographics are a big, big part of that. Uh, the other part is economic growth doesn't occur without some degree of energy growth. Right. And so that's a, that's a compelling reason to be represented in this sector. Uh, that said, it's also cyclical, and that's one of my, that's one of my number one rule. And, um, and we have to keep that in mind. It's also geopolitically and uh, driven. Uh, there are times when geopolitical events overwhelm us. That happened in 2008 and 2009. When we had the financial meltdown, oil went from 147 to $35 in less than a year. It didn't stay there, it was powerfully self-correcting, and we will get those times again. So the, 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 the other rule to remember is when, you know, the, the time to buy is when everybody hates it. And uh, right now we're in a sweet spot, it's fine. It's not at the high, it's not at the low. And I think uh, there'll be opportunities in the sectors we talked about. But uh, uh, if I had one area today uh, to focus on, it would be natural gas because we're, we've got probably more of a, a tailwind than a headwind on pricing and we've got a supply elasticity that is tenfold better than it was a decade ago. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, what would you have us all own some of? Some representation in upstream natural gas, one of the better suppliers of gas. Um, again, I can't make individual recommendations, but that's the, that's the fertile area today. You can be a contrarian in gas. We're, we're about to, we're uh, less than two years away, about a year and a half away from opening up U.S. deliverability of natural gas to the global market. That is going to be transformational. It'll be very rewarding to companies that help move, help provide that connectivity and that also, uh, also reach back into the producers of the gas in the major basins. Tom Petrie, you've had a fascinating career, which is in your new book, Following Oil, which is going on the Wealth Track bookshelf recommendation list. 
Uh, and it's also great to have you back in the investment banking business with Petrie Partners. So thanks very much for joining us, Tom. Thank you. Good to be here. At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is read Tom Petrie's book, Following Oil. If you are invested in energy stocks, and most of us are either actively or passively, and are interested in an extremely knowledgeable insider's view of the events that have rocked and shaped the oil and gas industry over the last 40 years, this is the book for you. Tom covers it all from his extremely well-connected vantage point of energy analyst and advisor to major industry players, as well as policymakers and regulators. He also provides a rational and realistic view of how to balance the growing energy, environmental, and national security concerns we face. Following oil is being added to our Wealth Track bookshelf. Well, next week, we will be starting our 10th season of Wealth Track, and we are doing so by helping the women in our lives achieve financial security. Two of our award winning Wealth Track women financial advisors will give us advice on how to build a financial plan that works in different stages of our lives. We will also discuss the role of prenups in the Wealth Track Women section of our website. Have a great first of the summer weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. Rosalind P. Walter and the Fairhome Foundation.